I'm really glad uh, to see all of you today on our uh, session. This is the second session when we are trying to do our webinar in English. Um, I see a lot of Russian names, but I am seeing not only Russian speaking names, so that's definitely good. I'm hoping that our community will be growing and we will have a new participant um, in our webinars. And uh, today um, uh, we have a special guest. Uh, this is a Bassem from London. Uh, he's working with us. He is a solution architect. And today he's going to uh, share his experience of working with microservice, API, um, management API internal and uh, the services. So um, a few announcements before we will start. Uh, the second one is about how we're going to conduct this session. Uh, as usually, you can post all of your question into the chat. We will group all of this question. And in the end of uh, our presentation, this question will be announced. As usual, uh, the three best question will be uh, um, recognized and uh, we will send a special gift for the owners of this question. Today's session will be more about practical uh, more than theory. So the half of the time we will spend on the presentation. Hope you will enjoy this information. And right now we are starting. So I'm going down and guys, please continue. Okay, I think I'm um, going to start now. Uh, hello, hello everyone. This is Basim Sudani. I'm senior uh, solution architect uh, for IPAM. Um, 15 years of experience um, delivering enterprise solutions, uh, including uh, design implementation of API-led connectivity, um, service-oriented architecture and microservice uh, across hybrid uh, IT landscape. Uh, this include architecture framework, uh, definition of key architecture deliverable and governance for different hybrid organization. So this is a short uh, introduction about myself. Um, so let's start talking today about uh, our uh, session. Let me just stop my video, just to enhance the streaming here. Um, today we're talking about the microservices architecture, uh, especially is a non-function aspect of microservice architecture. So let's uh, start. Um, the agenda today is uh, we're talking about a specific problem, which is uh, uh, observability of uh, microservice architecture. Uh, we'll talk about service management, which is uh, uh, internal service management between microservice uh, controller inside the cluster, and uh, API management for uh, to protect our services from external traffic. I'll call it like ingress controller for our cluster. And we will end it with demo. Um, the presentation, we shouldn't take more than 15 minutes because I, I would like to spend more time for the demo itself because we need to provision some controller, configure and test some of service management, uh, including circuits breaker, retrying policies and all of this good stuff related to service management. And then we do some demos around Kong controller and see how we can protect our services from uh, in external traffic by enforcing uh, security over our uh, services. Um, let's go ahead. So the statement today is around distributed system observability. So to make it very simple, defined is observability is uh, is the ability to answer any question about your business or solution. So if you develop your system or solution, you deploy it, um, you should be able to answer any question related to this business at any time, no matter how complex the system is. Sometimes we, we see a lot of business has like over hundreds of APIs and microservices deployed. And sometimes it's very complex to answer a question or trace a specific request from start until end. Um, as I said, it's uh, to do this in application development and operation, uh, sometimes complex, sometimes simple. It depends what exactly an instrument to your system or application to collect matrices or traces or logs by sending all of this data to uh, some sort of log aggregation, which it can help you to store and analyze your uh, application later on. As we said, the, the modern infrastructure itself evolving from monitoring mindset. And when we're talking about monitoring mindset is uh, 
Uh, in all the days, if you remember, we tried to monitor as uh, health of individual service because one service can be responsible for most of user experience. Uh, we're talking about service-oriented architecture at this point, but evolving from service-oriented architecture to uh, microservice architecture, it has a lot of challenges uh, around the uh, observability uh, topic. So if we go more detail about observability mindset, as we said, it's its degree uh, give a capability to team or company to inspect under, and understand the system and work around uh, the behavior of their system. Um, so as you see, we, we moved uh, uh, our mindset from the monitoring mindset, which is all the days to uh, observability mindset, which is uh, around microservice uh, pattern. This gives us a lot of benefits around observability. Um, so give us comprehensive understanding of our system. So if we have a specific issues in our system or we need to trace a specific transaction, we, we can do this if we have a good capability of around observability. Um, faster application uh, solving, because basically you, you understand your solution, you understand how to dig and trace your uh, request. Uh, give you more insight around your solution. Uh, having all of this uh, statistics and insights give you more uh, understanding of our solution so you can enhance your performance by time. And by the end, if you have most of these capabilities, your customer will be happy and uh, give them more revenue in future. Um, so in order to, to understand the observability, we need to understand what is the observability is. And so the observer, we, when we talk about observability, it's, we're talking about the first topic is the event logs pillar. Uh, the event itself is some sort of uh, immutable uh, data structure. It's time stamp record happened over time. We, we understand the event itself. So we, when we deliver solution, we write logs to a specific uh, log aggregator, or maybe we save the log to disk and we'll call it its immutable event. We cannot change this event once it's, it's recorded. Uh, the event itself can, can have different format. It can be plain text, it can be structured or binary. Um, so, so, so the more structured the event, it's more uh, easy for us to uh, dig inside the event and extract data from the event itself. Um, the binary one can be like um, uh, binary format. It's, it's used to uh, do more tracing around event. We can see this like in BFSense firewall, uh, we can extract this type of events and binary. Um, so what is the target here around event and why are we talking about event here? So we need to understand the target for our solution is to provide valuable insight. So when we uh, emitting events from our from our solution, we need to understand later on. We need to have some sort of insights. Um, we need to understand emergent and unpredictable behavior. So it's not just we produce event or emit event to leg aggregator. Uh, that's all we need to do. We need to maybe we can have some sort of machine learning uh, capability around the logs and take it from there and do more. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence to understand the behavior of our application, uh, maybe some sort of payment to microservice. We need to, to do some uh, work around um, uh, money laundry or some stuff like this. So all of this can come uh, from uh, uh, this type of behavior. Um, and the last topic is we need to make sure our application, when we deliver our solution itself, it can be loosely coupled. We don't need to have any tightly coupled between our solution itself and the logs, just in case of in future, if we need to migrate our logs from a specific log aggregator to future one or another one, we don't need this type of uh, code changes. So uh, at this moment, we need to have this capability of loosely coupled uh, component around the logs. Um, the second pillar uh, for the observability is the matrices. Is, so the definition of matrices is, uh, as you see, it's st statistics or, or presentation of data measured over time. Um, it can give us uh, uh, more statistics, statistics are our own solution. 
uh, using the statistics, we can enhance the performance of our application. Uh, the, the statistics itself, it, it has constant storage overhead. It's different than the event because the more traffic we have in the event, the more storage you need. But with this, with the with the matrix, with the matrix, is 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 the same consistent storage overhead. As I, as we said, the purpose is is more about uh, uh, extracting some statistics around our solution. Uh, we can do some sort of transformation mathematics uh, around this data. So at the end, we have some sort of reporting we can deliver to, to business people to do um, all of this. Uh, uh, analyzing uh, around the data itself. We can also using uh, the statistics to trigger alerts uh, based on a specific pattern for the statistics. Example here is uh, Prometheus. As we know, this is a, a time series uh, database. So we can use this solution to do some sort of uh, collecting statistics around our solution. The last pillar is the tracing pillar. Uh, as you see here, it's, it's very important pillar. Um, we need, if, if you want to understand the request from start until end, you need to have some sort of um, traceability. So when request comes, you need to link this request with another one. At the end, you can see the full picture of your uh, transaction. Um, again, the traceability is a series of related distributed event from system to another system. So basically it's around correlation ID from system X to Y to Z. At the end, you should have full picture around your solution itself. Uh, the three pillar together, it's complementary. So they complete each other. Logs, matrices, and traces, they are complementary. They provide the maximum visibility into your behavior of your distribution system. So it makes sense to have all of them together. So the logs has its own uh, capability, the same for matrices and traces. So this is introduction about the problem itself we're talking today, it's observability and how we can achieve this problem or how to resolve this problem into microservice architecture. Uh, we talked today around management control and we'll see how these controls can be correlated to observability problem. So when we talk about management control, we talk about service management capability and API management capability. The service management capability is around how we can manage uh, the services uh, internally inside our cluster, for example. So if we have hundreds or, or thousands of services inside our cluster, can, how we can handle the services itself, how we can control the access management and let's say the uh, uh, circuit breaker, a retry mechanism between the services, who's accessing what. So all of this good stuff internally inside the cluster uh, we call it service management capability. So it's focusing on operational control and service health internally inside the cluster itself. Another topic is around API management. So if you want to, um, to protect your services or your cluster from external traffic, uh, which is around ingress controller inside your uh, EKS. So talk about the service management first. So here's an example of service management. Let's say we have uh, in our cluster service E and service P, and uh, we need to handle this type of uh, service management between them to handle the traffic between them. Let's say so we need to uh, uh, extract the logs. Uh, we need to say, we need to implement some sort of retrying mechanism. Let's say the service invokes the service. We need maybe if the service is down for some time, we need to retry every two seconds for X number of time. And then we do something. Maybe we can handle some sort of circuit breaker as well. So this, this service can handle up to, let's say X number of uh, connection. Uh, after this time, the circuit breaker will be open. And again, the access control, who's accessing uh, the service, all of this stuff, it can be handled by service management. So as you see, it is, everything is internally and the service management, as you see, it is, it is around how you, management, how you manage your service into your cluster. Um, traditionally, if you, if you want to, to add this type of capability, you need to, for example, if you have uh, Node.js 
service and let's say Java service here, you want to handle, let's say, retrying mechanisms. We need to, let's say, you're working in Node.js, so you need to, uh, to install library around retrying mechanism and you do all of this inside your solution. By implementing all of this non-functional requirement inside your solution itself, you, your solution became more tightly coupled with non-functional requirement. Let's say the retrying mechanism, circuit breaker, uh, logs. So in this session, we'll try to make our solution loosely coupled with all of this non-functional requirement observability pillars. Uh, here it came the service mesh to, um, to resolve all of these issues around service management. So what the service mesh is doing is um, it's, it, 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 it realize the capability if loosely coupled. So by having some sort of proxy over your service, so by the end, at the end, your service will do the uh, function requirement only, and the proxy will handle everything for you. So if let's say service A need to invoke service B, and then need to retry X number of time, you don't need to implement all of this logic inside your solution. So your solution is purely around the business itself. The proxy will do everything for you. The proxy will uh, handle all of retrying mechanism. The proxy will protect your service. Again, as we said, uh, against number of connection, we call it a circuit breaker. Um, the proxy also will log everything for you. You don't need, as a service, you need to handle any log forwarding or log appender or anything around non-functional aspect of the logs. The proxy will handle everything for you. We'll see this later uh, during the demo. Uh, so the, the app mesh itself, uh, it is management service by AWS. Um, it has an, its own uh, structure. So if you want to, to integrate your EKS cluster or your microservice cluster or your Fargate cluster or ECS cluster, as you see, if you, app mesh it does, is not only for EKS, it can be, uh, integrated with a lot of AWS services, EC2, ECS, Fargate, and 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 EKS as well. Uh, the application structure, the design, it started by having a mesh uh, application. Each application has a node. Has a has a node. Okay, uh, the node is mapped to service. Service has a router, and you can route your service uh, to specific node. Um, as we said, it's it's more most of the stuff is here is our, our logical component of app mesh. So the app mesh is the boundary for all of your applications. So everything started by app mesh, and then you have virtual node. The virtual node is logically pointer to a particular EC2 instance or EKS instance. For example, if you have um, a payment a microservice in EKS, you need to have a virtual node for this microservice. So the virtual node is logical uh, representation of a EKS microservice uh, node or service. The virtual service, it's abstraction of real service. So in EKS, when you uh, deploy, for example, a pod, you have a service for this pod, so you can, you can invoke the service. And this is exactly the same. It's virtual service is abstraction of real service in EKS. So this is one-to-one -one relationship. The virtual router is, is used to, to handle all this capability around routing traffic and weighted traffic policy and uh, retrying mechanisms. We see this later as well. So as you see here is a virtual router. A virtual router, we use it to, to route the request, to route traffic, to route transaction to specific upstream uh, microservices uh, here. Uh, in this example, we have a policy over the router to route 80% of traffic to the service and 20% of the traffic to the service, which we call it uh, canary deployments. So the app mesh itself will, will realize most of uh, observability pillar, uh, including logging, matrices, and tracing. I want to talk about all of them again. Uh, we understand now the event logs, uh, the matrices, and tracing. Uh, app mesh, it's you don't need to do anything. App Mesh is uh, integrating everything for you. You just need to uh, deploy the App Mesh controller into your cluster, and App Mesh will uh, trace your application by integrating your application, for example, with X-Ray. 
uh, it emit all of matrices for you as well, whether it's ingress or egress. Uh, you can also emit your logging to uh, your favorite log aggregator. Today we'll emit our logs to CloudWatch. Uh, um, the last topic is app mesh uh, security. Um, it's 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 for for some of us it's it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand the security inside the service container itself because why we need to secure service to service inside the cluster. But sometimes in, in some environment, we call it zero trust environment. So let's say we have a payment service microservice and we have a shipment service. Sometimes they are in different namespace or they are in zero trust environment. So, um, but how we, how we can resolve security at this, point, at this moment? I've mesh introduced for you the mutual authentication. So with the mutual authentication, each service can in introduce or identify themselves to another service. So if I'm service X, I want to invoke, let's say, shipment service and payment service, I want to invoke another service. So basically, I need to introduce myself to the service by giving my certificate to the service. The same for this service need to give me uh, its own certificate. So that's what's called mutual authentication. So each, each service need to show themselves their identity to other service. Uh, we'll see this later on the demo as well. Um, the app mesh uh, security uh, integrate with different mutual authentication mechanisms. So we, you can um, deploy your service with embedded uh, a certificate for your container or you can integrate with uh, SDS, which is a secure uh, discovery service of uh, Envoy, or you can integrate with uh, EWS certificate manager, uh, private managers, but private certificate authority. We see this as well later on. Um, so we, we, we are done with this, this, the internal service to service communication management. So the next step is to protect our cluster uh, externally. So let's say we have consumer which is outside our cluster or, or over internet. So how we can uh, protect ourselves from this, uh, uh, from this uh, traffic, um, I will call it API management. So we, we need some sort of a layer over our cluster here. So to protect ourselves, some sort of firewall. So at the end, we can uh, enable or enforce policies such as throttling application, uh, sorry application tracing and data caching as well. So by the end, if we bought everything together, whether it's a service management and API management, you, you should have a complete uh, secure and observe, observability system. So from outside or is from the API management layer, you should have scalability uh, around HPA of your uh, ingress controller, who sees this later on observability as well. So your, your ingress controller uh, to protect your uh, microservices will have a capability to integrate with monitoring component uh, like X-Ray, for example, or Prometheus and emit logs to CloudWatch, see this as well. Uh, you can also enforce security at the API layer. So you can say, I want to enforce some sort of uh, open API uh, uh, policy, you can let's say basic authentication, whatever, uh, SAML authentication, you can enforce at this level. Um, this, the, again, as well, if you have some sort of customization over your API manager, so let's say you want to, to have uh, custom plugins, for example, you want to integrate with a custom authentication system in your enterprise, you can still do this with the API manager we introduced today. So if we bought everything together, we should have um, service management as a controller over your cluster. So it can control your services internally. Uh, we should have API manager, which can protect your cluster from outside uh, traffic. Um, today we will present a uh, Kong as, as um, API manager. So any, any requests coming to your cluster will go through the Kong, Kong ingress controller. We'll enforce some policy over Kong, let's say, we enforce rate limiting uh, e policy, we enforce API token policy. Uh, Kong has a lot of annotation and a lot of plugins you can integrate. So today we just in, will demo two of them. For the uh, app mesh itself, we'll see how we can enforce 
circuit breaker, retrying mechanism, and we'll see the weight policy um, uh, in, uh, as well. So let's go to the, the demo. Uh, so the demo today is um, just so our demo is uh, we uh, will will provision AKS cluster over a three a subnet in different availability zone in AWS. Um, we will be integrating with X-ray for tracing observability. If you remember, observability has uh, the the uh, tracing pillar. So we going to integrate with X-ray. I will see how X-ray will, will can give us insight around our traffic. So from start until end, uh, we see the CloudWatch integration with uh, AppMesh itself. Uh, we'll use AppMesh service management from AWS to uh, manage all of our microservices inside our cluster. Uh, there are examples around Certificate Manager and the ECR as well. Certificate Manager, as we said, to enforce mutual authentication inside our clusters. Uh, if Service X want to, in to integrate or invoke another service, you can use a Certificate Manager as a private certificate authority to um, authorize client to invoke another client. So it's, it's, this is basically what we will try to uh, demo today. So let's go ahead to to use this. Everything it's, it's uploaded to uh, GitHub under this repository. So let's go ahead and see what we have right now. So it's everything, it's, it's a Terraform. Uh, as I said, it's uh, VPC, it will create for you VPC, it creates for you subnets, uh, three subnets with different uh, CIDR notation. It will create for you net uh, since we, uh, let's go here. Since we, we are deploying our microservice in private subnets, we cannot access the internet or uh, internet gateway. We need some sort of net gateway. So that's why we have not one net gateway in the public subnet here to, uh, to do all of egress from the private subnet. Um, so I already run the cluster because it takes around 15 minutes. So let's just take this away. It take around 15 minutes to uh, uh, provision the cluster, but I wrote, I wrote for you all of the steps needed for your cluster here. Um, I install as well the flowing D log forward. Um, so this component is, is, is needed to forward all of logs from your EKS cluster to CloudWatch, uh, already installed. Uh, you have steps here for Elasticsearch as well. I installed the app mesh controller and I stopped until here. So everything after this we need to do starting from now. Um, so if I come here, uh, look my mesh. So if I go to my cluster, You see the cluster doesn't have anything, just the app mesh controller. As you see, you can install the app mesh controller with all of these commands. I list everything for you. So let's start to deploy our first application and see uh, how we can demonstrate the app mesh and the API management controls. So this is, uh, it will install the first application. Basically it's, it's a basic application, nothing there. So if you go here, it's, um, just microservice Spring uh, application, um, Spring Boot application, just Hello World, stuff like this. Um, the application is, uh, if you go back to here, we have Echo Server. So it's basically the entry point here. This entry point, we can invoke uh, Echo of this country, UK, or Echo of uh, Canada, for example. Um, yeah, so we, if we come here, Let's see. So as you see, it's um, the first eco server is Canada uh, version one. Second one is the UK version one. It's deployed over one uh, uh, replica set for now. And uh, the entry point is eco server. So basically if you want to test the services, you can log into eco server and then you can invoke this one and this one. 
So the first, let, let's see. Um, let's try to make sure that everything's up and running before we move forward with AWS uh, App Mesh. Let's try to log into um, Eco Server. Just make sure everything is up and running before we move forward. So let's try CRL to this Canada V1. As you can see, it's this this server, Eco Server, trying to reach out the server. So everything is good. The application is up and running, uh, which is the basic step before we move forward. So the the next step is to um, integrate our application with AppMesh. But if you are interested to uh, integrate your application with Matchwell authentication, whether it's file-based or SDS-based, you need to follow the steps here. Um, the difference between uh, application without Matchwell authentication file-based is while we're deploying our, our application, we need to mount or we need to attach the certificate to our application. Um, all of the steps is here. You have the, uh, the manifest here as well. If you notice, there is no difference between this application and another application. The only difference is we need to mount the certificate to your container or your pod. So when the application is up and running, it will uh, fetch the certificate from the local mounted uh, disk space. Uh, so let's move forward. Uh, assuming we don't need to match your authentication at this moment, but you have the less the steps here. So let's try to integrate our application with AWS uh, App Mesh. Uh, so as I'm going to try to run this one. First, we need to exit. So let's see what the, what this exactly. If you look here, we're trying to uh, create a mesh, um, which is AWS Mesh. We try to create a virtual node. Uh, it's called, um, yeah, instead of, let's open it here as well. We can compare this with this one. So it's better like this. So it's, here's uh, our app mesh um, we created here. And then inside our, our app mesh, we created, uh, okay, this is old one is fine for now. Uh, we created our first uh, virtual node, and then we created virtual node for Canada. We created virtual node for uh, for UK. Ignore V2 for now, just all the implementation. So we created here three virtual node. If you open the virtual node, for example, let's see how it looks like. For example, the eco server, as we said, this is the front end services. So we can we can invoke the back end services from there. So the eco server has two back ends. So from eco servers, we can invoke Canada server or we can invoke UK server. And is, as you see here, you can see uh, the Canada server is, is a virtual service. So virtual node has a virtual service and the virtual service has a virtual router. So the virtual service itself has a routes. So we say, if you want to invoke Canada, you have this routes. For now, we route only to virtual one, ver version one with 100%. So later on, when we deploy Canada version two, we can see how we can divide the traffic between version one and version two. So for now, the traffic will go only with version one with 100%, um, as you see. Um, okay, let's go here, route. So if I open this route, um, we have as well retrying mechanism here. If you remember, we said we don't need to implement all of this non-function requirement inside our solution. So the, the app mesh can do this for you. So you can come here and say, um, I want to, 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 to enforce a retrying mechanism over the service for X number of time. And between each time you can put a specific number. Um, so by the end, we have uh, eco server one, we have a UK version one, you have Canada one. So let's let's start and uh, see how we can do this uh, managed service.
So if, if you notice here, we annotate our uh, we annotate our um, namespace to have a sidecar to in include in VoI uh, sidecar. So if you go to uh, AKS cluster and open any of this application we deploy it, for example, we open the pod. You can see the pod has different component or different container. The first one is our application itself. The second one is the Envoy uh, proxy. And the third one, X-Ray uh, uh, container. So all of this stuff, it's needed for different functionality. As we said, Envoy is the main component uh, to all the proxy to integrate with App Mesh, the X-Ray to integrate with traceability pillar, which is AWS X-Ray. Okay, let's let's go back and try to um, so now I will try to to log into the echo service first I will try to log to try to invoke specific service uh, let's say Canada or UK from the server and say the Canada's V1 is up and running, everything is good. We can go to, for example, to UK, Canada one, sorry, Canada one. And again, it's it's up and running. So what we are doing now, we're trying to uh, ask the app mesh to uh, invoke this service name for us. And everything is up and running. Since we have only version one, everything is, is, is straightforward up until now. Again, if you want to, um, uh, include mutual authentication, you have all of the steps here. For the mutual authentication, the only difference is if you open, for example, the eco service, if you want to um, enforce a security of TLS, you come here, you said enforce it, and then you start to put your certificate, whether it's a local file hosting, as I said, you need to add your certificate inside your uh, pod before you deploy it or you can integrate with uh, SDS, with Secret Discovery Service. You can have some sort of uh, Aspire a server inside your cluster. Also, you have the steps here, or you can integrate with EWS Certificate Authority so uh, to enforce this type of mutual authentication. But today we, we don't do this, but the example itself has all of the steps needed for enforcing the mutual authentication in your uh, cluster. So let's go ahead with more uh, exciting uh, test. We are going to deploy another version of the application, which is version two. So what happened, um, it, it deploys a, a virtual node for you. It, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't clean the application before I run the demo, but again, it's, uh, uh, at the end we have, um, for each server, we have version one and version two, like Canada van, version one, version two. We have UK version one, UK version two, and we have the front end service. Uh, let's let's try again to uh, to log into front end service and invoke UK or Canada. But before we move ahead, let's go to uh, to route and see what's going on with the route. If you look at the route, you will find out if you try today or now try to invoke the Canada service. It has an, a routing policy with 90% to go to version one and 10% going to version two. So this is something we, we discussed before uh, uh, around canary deployment. So you can route your, uh, you can enforce your in, uh, routing policy in AWS App Mesh. Um, the same for um, Duke, it's, it has different routing policy. It has 95, 5%. We will change this later on and see how it will affect our application. So first let's uh, try to log in again or uh, execute this uh, bot. So now I'm, I'm inside the bot itself. Uh, so the, the first step is I will try to invoke uh, for example, a UK server. So the UK server is returning UK version one. So why it's returning UK version one? So let's go to the router and see why, and what's the routing policy. As you can see, it's 95.5%. So it is rare to find version two 
in the request itself. So if, let's try many time, it's almost version one, as you see. So let's try to, um, to edit the route, for example, make it 50%. And save, okay. And then let's let's make a loop. I think it's it's almost fifty percent between V one and V two. Um, it's it's we don't need to change anything in our uh, solution itself. As we said, AppMesh proxy doing this all of this for us. Uh, we can enforce uh, the weight between different versions. Of the same service in our cluster is this only we can do on enforce at this time no we, we can do a lot of stuff let's say if we are in canada version one and we need to have some sort of um, um let's say circuit breaker we need to say okay canada version one cannot afford more than let's say five connection per time how we can do this we can come here and say um we need to enable connection pool and the connection pool here is the circuit breaker so we basically say i want to i i have a limit of five uh, thread per time uh, we can afford and then we can also uh, have a queue for them or bending request five and five so basically at this time if we enforce five and five and we have more than five the service will respond back with 503 and it will open the circuit for you. And so if anyone or more requests come to the circuit, the circuit will respond back with 503 because we cannot accommodate more than the expected connection. Um, there is a lot of uh, 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 non-function requirement you can enforce at this moment. Um, like uh, let's say the outlier, outlier detection, it's another uh, feature of EWS app mesh. So you can enforce this. Let's say you want to um, uh, to have some sort of health check over your service, and if the service has X number of uh, five X errors, you can eject your service from your uh, routing policy. You can do this as well here. Uh, you have health check over your services. You have timeout as well. So it's a lot of added function for you in this control plane. You can control your microservices from here. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's as you see, it's 50 50%. Percent. Uh, so let's stop this and move forward. Um, the next one is around the connection pool. As we said, we can enforce the circuit breaker by enforcing number of connection can invoke the service. The retrying policy as well, you can do this. Uh, uh, let's say Canada invoke UK. Um, if UK is down for X number of time, you can uh, retrying every two seconds. You can do all of this as well from here, as we saw. You have example here. For... Basil, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, we have a question and it looks like it will be reasonable to answer for this question right now. The question was about how to enable circuit bracket. Could you please just show it right now? Yes, yeah, sure. It's, uh, as I said, circuit breaker implementation in AWS, it's, it's a connection pool. Uh, so let's say it's, um, as we said, let's go back to one of the service here, version one of Canada. We need to enable circuit breaker and say, okay, I would like to have maximum five connection simultaneously together, like five threads coming to my service. Over than this, I can have a five bending request. Over than five plus five, I will open the circuit. So I will say, okay, I cannot afford more than this connection at this time. Uh, and this is, we call it circuit breaker. Uh, so the implementation of circuit breaker inside the app mesh it is a connection pool itself. I can't show you this, um, but I need to open Gmeter. Uh, I, you will see once we open the Gmeter, you can see some of requests will, go, will get 503 because the circuit breaker will open and will reject any more connection more than five or more than 10, five plus five. Um, so let's move forward. We can go back this topic around the circuit breaker and retrying policy. I can open for you the G meter and show you uh, threading and 503 coming back from the service because the service can not accommodate more than 10 requests per time. Um, so as you see, it's uh, the app mesh, we can control the services, we can enforce the security, we can enforce policy, retrying policy, circuit breaker, 
uh, the logging as well, the logging as well, as we said, it's, it's another topic. Uh, it's out that like by default, we can integrate it with uh, CloudWatch. Uh, so if you open CloudWatch, for example, and, and see the log group, As you see here, it's it's um, if you open UK version one, you can you can see all of logs generated from our application. This is because as the app mesh itself, it, it is native integrated with CloudWatch. What once we we install the uh, Fluentd in our cluster, um, the traceability here. So if we go back to X-ray, for example, so let's see me open X-ray and see how it works. And the why X-ray is running here, because when we install the, uh, the app mesh controller, we ask the app mesh, we need the traceability of X-ray. Is the X-ray is the only option for us here? No, the, X, the app mesh can integrate with different traceability uh, component. Uh, the X-ray is one of them. You can take a look at different component uh, for traceability. So for traceability, as you see here, um, you can see your request. I'm as a client. I try to invoke a UK server or a Canada server. We did the traceability here around UK version one and version two. And as you see, I'm as a client. Okay, as a client, I invoke the the, the, the endpoint, and then the endpoint invoke version one and then version two. And there is a lot of capability here around the X-ray. It's, it's different topic, but I just want to show you how it's mostly. App mesh integrated with X ray. So, a lot of statistics here, a lot of uh, good stuff, a lot of traces. Uh, so, you can see the, the request itself, you can see the header, response, exceptions. Uh, it's really convenient tool for a traceability pillar. Um, so, let's move forward um, with, with more uh, API management control. So, we are done now with the service control, which is how service invoke another service, how we enforce all of this uh, policy and stuff. So let's let's talk about the external traffic. So we said, okay, now we can invoke the service internally. We implement uh, circuit breaker, uh, retrying policy and all of this stuff. So let's move forward with the external traffic. The external traffic, as we said, we need some sort of ingress controller to our cluster. So let's move forward to install the ingress controller. Um, the first step is to integrate the ingress controller with our cluster is to uh, create an orchestra virtual node for the ingress controller. So if we refresh here, you see it's this is a new virtual node. As we agreed, each microservice service, we need to have some sort of virtual node. So it's one-to-one -one mapping between app mesh and uh, EKS cluster. So if we have King controller, King ingress controller, we need to have virtual node for this King ingress controller. So if you look at the service we just deployed here, you see it's created for us virtual node and the back end for this virtual node, it has the server of Canada, it has the servers of UK. So uh, if you invoke the ingress control for King, it can give you a egress to, to this type of services. And the service itself, the host name for the service is a Kong Kong proxy service class, but we don't have this now in the EKS. So if you go to the EKS, we don't have any ingress controller, controller for Kong ingress. So let's try to deploy that ingress controller into the cluster. Again, it's everything is here, so you don't need to really do a lot of research. Okay, so it's um, it's deployed, but I'll show you some issues here. If we try to see what's wrong with the conk, it it it's in bending states because since we control our cluster uh, by app mesh controller, uh, app mesh controller it's it's protecting our cluster from any egress or any ingress. So basically, we need to uh, have some work around around to give the conk to download the image from Kong website and deploy our controller. So the workaround here is to give this user a workaround to uh, grab or fetch the image from uh, Docker 
and deploy our uh, worker here. So let's see, it's work. So what will happen at this moment? Uh, it will create for us a new bot for the Kong. And what's the Kong? It is a uh, server running behind application load balancer. So if you go back to uh, your EC2 instance, you will find there is a new load balancer is, is coming up for you. So there is new load balancer is coming up for you once you deploy the ingress controller. As we said, the ingress controller is, uh, we enable the external traffic to our cluster. The only option we have here is to enable or to provision application load balancer. So the, the uh, Kong ingress controller deployed this for us. We don't need to do all of this. So once it is deployed, it will create the, the bot for us as well, or the ingress controller for us. So uh, it's, it's already good to go. It's green, deploy it. Um, it has, um, as you see, it, it, it includes a sidecar if in void. Uh, if you notice, since we are deploying everything inside app mesh, everything is coming as a sidecar. So this container or this Kong Kong is integrated with app mesh through the, um, as we said, through the virtual node. So the virtual node, it pointing to Kong Kong proxy, which is the same, uh, the same image we have here, which is a Kong Kong uh, uh, ingress controller. So everything is, it looks good. Now the, the controller is up and running. The controller is linked with app mesh through the virtual node. So if we try to uh, invoke the controller, the controller has access only to the services at, at this moment. Is this all we need to do? We need to, uh, to deploy the ingress resources. I, I don't want to talk about the ingress uh, component of Kubernetes, assuming some of you understand this. So the next step for ingress controller to, to start to, we need to have ingress controller. What is the ingress controller? Let's open it. So basically we say we need to, to allow the external traffic, okay, to our cluster through these two endpoints. So we, we will expose Echo Canada server and Echo UK server only for uh, external traffic. So the external traffic can invoke our services through this uh, entry point. So let's let's try to uh, deploy the, uh, the ingress resources. So what happened here, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear. It deploys ingress resource. If you want to see what the ingress resource looks like, you can you get ingress. Uh, as you see, it's uh, deployed resources. Um, it has two endpoints. The first endpoint is slash echo slash echo server Canada or slash echo slash echo server UK. Sorry, it's Canada and UK. Um, the host, as you see, it is uh, the application load balancer. It's it provisioned for us. So if you go back to EC2 instance, make sure this is the same application load balancer provisioned by a uh, Kong ingress controller. Um, so let's go back here. Uh, okay. Uh, at this moment, uh, we are ready to invoke. So what we do, so we can take this. We can map this to... Uh, uh, route 53, but uh, we don't have time to do all of this. So let me copy this, uh, let's say here. And then we said there is two entry points at this moment is that first one is eco server dash UK or eco server dash Canada. So I'm going to invoke Canada. And as you see, it is, um, it is succeeded to invoke the server. So uh, I'm not sure if, uh, what is the weighted policy of Canada? I think it's 90 something, 90, 10 or something like that. But we are sure about UK. UK is 50, 50%. So if we try to invoke UK, it's, uh, the chances is 50, 50, as you see. Um, the next step is to enable rate limiting in uh, ingress controller. Uh, so I say, um, I want to have, to give this client or uh, this consumer five requests per minute, maybe. So we can do this with the Kong ingress controller by enforcing the rate limit. So if we, do, if we look, take a look at the rate limit, it's, it's basically, it's, as you see, it's, it's a plugin for Kong. 
we say we need to enforce rate limit over this namespace. So it, uh, we can enforce over the namespace or we can enforce the rate limit over a specific endpoint on our cluster. For now, we enforce a rate limit over all of our cluster, over, sorry, over all of uh, this namespace, which is development namespace. So we said we need, we enforce 10 requests per minute for this uh, development namespace. So let's, let's deploy this uh, rate limit one. Sorry. Copy this one. So the rate limit is, is already created, but we need to uh, reload uh, or to or batch the ingress resource. Because if you go back to the ingress resource, you try to, to see how it looks like, you will not see any rate limiting enforcement at this moment. You don't see any annotation for rate limit. You need to re reload the ingress resource each time you enforce. Uh, policy. So let's let's enforce it. And again, if you try to to describe the ingress, oh sorry, scratch. If you try to um, to describe the ingress, you see there's a Kestra annotation for you, which is uh, we should have. Oh, okay, so there's a Kestra annotation which is a plugins which is relate rate rate per lim, uh, per minute. Sorry. So now we, we enforce, uh, if you go back to rate limit, we enforce 10 requests per minute per customer. So if we try to invoke this 10 times, so it's, it's a uh, API kit uh, rate limit exceeded. So, um, so it's a succeeded kit use case. So can, again, you can do this and see what is the header returned by Kong Ingress. Okay, sorry. It's this one. So as you see, it's the rate limit here is, is 10 and so it's the remaining is nine. So the, the more you do it, it return for you more headers in the response. You can use this uh, in your uh, consumer side. Uh, the second rate limit we will uh, enforce here is the API uh, limit. Uh, it's some sort of, let's say, it's symbol uh, uh, security enforcement for uh, API. So you can um, inject some sort of keys when you're trying to invoke the, the API. This is uh, how it looks like. It's basically, it's uh, we said we need to enforce API key over this endpoint. So any customer cannot invoke this this endpoint unless they can provide the API key itself. So if we go back here, this is how we enforce it. Okay, the, uh, it's created. Uh, the second step, as we agreed, we need to uh, reload or to, we need to patch the ingress resources by adding the API key and read limiting by minute as well. So, so. Okay, so it's, uh, it's already uh, batched. So if we go back, try to describe the ingress, uh, you will see it's more annotation or more plugins uh, included it's uh, API key and rate limited rate limit by minute. So if we try to invoke the endpoint at this moment, it tell you there is no API key found in your request. Um, you can provision the stuff again. It's uh, it's easy uh, integration of this API key. It's, it's using uh, Copernic secrets. Uh, so you need to create a secret first, and then. He deploys a secret to Kubernetes secrets. And then you are ready to invoke the service itself. So I need to see our elites from here because I need to uh, send header and the request with the secret key in order to invoke the service. 
So as I say, it's uh, HTTP okay. The API key uh, uh, security enforcement is, is good. And then we consume one request out of 10. So in, in the next time, API key is good. And then we have eight and so on so far. Uh, this is this is my demo uh, today. I it's it's over forty five minutes. Sorry. Um, so during this demo, as you see, we enforce two type of uh, security um, service communication security, which is, which is internal security in the app mesh app mesh service management. It's a lot of stuff inside. It. I, I, I encourage you to take a look at the uh, all the features enabled under app mesh, including circuit breaker retrying policy, routing, uh, mutual authentication. I added a lot of examples here for Kong for mutual authentication, whether it's SDS, as I said, it's a uh, it's, um, secure discovery service from uh, Envoy. So if you have this background around Envoy secure discovery service, you can come here for them and then you can integrate with SDS uh, as uh, your TLS enforcement, uh, for example. Um, I, I did this example, but unfortunately, this type of stuff can consume time from us. So for uh, I added it for you. You can try by yourself, integrate this uh, app mesh service with um, uh, SDS. Uh, this is uh, all of uh, I needed to tell you today around the API management and service management uh, controls. Yeah, that's that's all um, for my side. Is there any question? Yes, Basim, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, we have uh, several questions. Um, if you don't mind, I will start. The first question is related to the performance. So um, any ideas about performance will be uh, useful for us. Uh, and the question sounds like, uh, as login have cost uh, against performance, the tracing is kind of logs. Uh, how we can control the bad performance in uh, if we use the tracing? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the performances because if if you take a look at the app mesh, app mesh is a control plane to manage the envoy proxy. So, um, talking about the performance of your, your application, the application is not tightly coupled with all of these matrices and logs, and it is a extra layer proxy to control your application. Uh, the Envoy itself, it is very light proxy. It's it's developed uh, using C++. So I don't think there are any performance overhead over your application. In all of cases, you need to omit your logs uh, from your solution. So your solution at this moment doesn't need to do anything, just uh, print out logs to the console and the app mesh will take it from there. So if you take a look here, uh, this is how we integrate. Uh, sorry, how we integrate App Mesh with uh, logs. Uh, it's nothing you can do. Just uh, print out your logs to console, and the proxy will take it from there. So I don't think there is any overhead uh, related to uh, your application. Uh, it's extra layer to control or uh, and manage your microservice. Um, if you're talking about a, a, like maximum performance i don't think there is maximum performance at this moment okay thank you so if we will speak about the whole integration flow uh, from the client till the back end and um, let's assume uh, the service will take about one second uh, the uh, additional uh, performance issue based on the communication through the app mesh do you see any performance issue uh, based on your experience no, I, I don't see any performance issues. Okay. It depends on your uh, security enforcement. So uh, for example, here, uh, let me just uh, maximize this. Uh, for example, here, some customers, they can uh, have TLS, for example, at uh, uh, application load balancer level. Uh, we know, and we are aware, all of the security encryption, decryption can consume time as well, can consume part of performance of your application, can consume part of, uh, uh, of uh, latency between the consumer and the server itself. So the more security enforcement, the more layer you added between as a consumer and the service itself, it can take from your latency. But in general, to be honest, I don't, I, I, did, I didn't notice any latency. Um, like it's, it's still uh, at, at the acceptable level. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And the second question, uh, the second question related to App Mesh. Um, do we need to change maybe at some library in our services to use App Mesh? No. This is the, this is the, the point we. As we agree, all of us, we need to separate non-functional requirement from functional requirement. So at the end, if we deploy application or microservice, whether it's Node.js or .NET or Java, this, this application need to concentrate in the functional scope. We don't care about the logs. We don't care about traceability. We don't care about mattress. We just need to do all of our business logic, just print uh, stuff to uh, console. We don't care about anything. Uh, App Mesh integrate well with the EKS. Nothing we need. We need to do nothing. We need to add the solution itself. If you take a look at as a solution, I included the source code. You will never see anything related to App Mesh or AWS or Kubernetes or nothing. There is nothing at all. It's just pure Java application deployed inside the cluster, and the App Mesh will take it from there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sec the second question is about LWS. Uh, how uh, and Pavel, sorry if I'm uh, und not understand your question correct. How to handle the Kubernetes nodes with uh, Fargate? It's uh, this type of uh, it's EKS, not Fargate. Uh, again, the App, App Mesh can integrate with the Fargate as well. Uh, it is the same infrastructure. Okay, so you don't need to worry about any integration inside your solution itself. You just need to integrate the, EK, uh, the app mesh with the Fargate. So this, this type of integration already exists. You don't need to do anything. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a question and this question was raised during discussion uh, about the second bracket. So the initial question was well, how uh, how can we enable circuit breaker due to the metrics? And then we have additional question. If the service takes uh, an average 10 seconds, how we can implement this? Looks like we are assuming that our service will work pretty long time. Does it change our solution? Um, so we talk about the circuit breaker and uh, retrying policy at this moment. So. Um, the first question, sorry, it was around the circuit breaker or, um, sorry, I forgot to select the question. Yeah, um, uh, let's rephrase it and let's assume, so we have a service. This service is working around 10 seconds. And if we are implementing a circuit bracket, does it end have any sense to change the policy in case if we are assuming the service will be working for a long time? Yeah, because as you know, the circuit breaker is, is a connection pool. It's, uh, so let's say you have requests come and your service expecting to, to run 10 seconds, uh, which is abnormal for synchronous, for API itself. But let's say we have this type of behavior. So you need to make sure your connection pool is, is again, is this 10 seconds. So if you have thousand client need to invoke, you need to, to both in advance this connection pool uh, or increase it. So because one connection can be consumed up to 10 seconds. So if you have 1,000, you need to make sure you have 1,000 connection for each client. Again, this is a, a multi-threaded connection. Um, it's not a barrel connection. So if you have one client occupy 10 seconds and you have 1,000 clients, you need to make sure you have minimum 1,000 connection open for all 1,000 uh, clients. I know it's rare to have 1,000 client invoking the same service at the same time. But again, you need to put this calculation into mind when you uh, deploy your uh, app mesh. Good, thank you. The next one, is a cluster to cluster connection feature? Could you please explain, do you see any uh, cluster to cluster feature in the solution? I'm, I'm not sure about cluster to cluster. You mean invoke service from cluster to another cluster? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's already implemented under App Mesh. It's basically the different, if, if you take a look at the node itself, you, you will find the node is annotated with the namespace. So, um, so you can invoke namespace from namespace, or you can invoke, I think the question is around from App Mesh to another App Mesh, right? I'm just trying to- I don't know. Uh, Pavel, if you are still with us, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question.
Yeah, yeah in so general, the question is about from yeah. one app mesh to another. So, for example, two different yeah, you can, you can, you can with, with app mesh, you can share the mesh with different teams. So you can invoke mesh from another mesh. Again, if you look at the mesh, the entry point for the mesh, uh, it can be Kong Kong if you will use API management. Another feature for app mesh is a virtual gateway. I didn't talk about the virtual gateway, but it's, it's, it is another uh, ingress controller for the app mesh. Um, the alternative for this is to use King Kong, but you can go ahead and try the a virtual gateway. It's another ingress to your app mesh. So basically, you, if you want, you don't want to use a King Kong to with all of this uh, capability, you can use virtual gateway, but you will lose a lot of uh, uh, features. For example, you cannot enforce rate limiting, you cannot enforce uh, API keys and all the stuff we saw in the King Kong. With the virtual gateway, it's really basic implementation of ingress controller. Good, thank you. And maybe the last one, what we have so far. Uh, how we can implement app mesh on primes, uh, not on the cloud? Um, it's app mesh is, is AWS managed service, so uh, it's we cannot deploy it as in on on prem. But if we take a look at the app mesh, app mesh is basically is a control plane for envoy proxy. Yeah. So at the end, app mesh doesn't do a lot of stuff for you. It's just some user interface. You bought retrying mechanism, you bought connection ball, you bought a waiting policy, you enforce TLS. At the end, you enter stuff. Once you save, take app mesh, take all of this uh, configuration and serialize it to the info envoy proxy. Um, you cannot do this on prem, but you have another solution. If you don't want to have app mesh to control your envoy, you can have Istio. For example, which is another alternative, uh, you can have it on on prem uh, because app mesh is managed service. Uh, I don't think we can have the managed service uh, on prem, uh, but you have another alternative to manage Envoy proxy by having Istio, for example. Okay, thank you, Basim. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting uh, and for all participants, uh, what we have today. I'm just posting uh, to the chat um, our channel, uh, our Telegram channel, where uh, we can discuss any question. And mostly right now, we're interested in your feedback. Uh, how do you like our session? What you'd like to switch? What kind of question do you have? Definitely, it will be considered in our next uh, sessions. So thank you very much and hope to see you once again. Thank you, guys. Thank you.